Welcome to my world. So a fair number of you watching this have probably been pretty cold for most of this week. As a huge portion of the United States and Canada was swept over by something called a polar vortex, a runaway swirling mass of cold Arctic air. Granted, it warms a fair bit by the time it actually reaches you guys, so it's not as cold as it would be. But compared to what most of you are probably used to, it was apparently extremely cold. Now, for those new to the channel, I live in Alaska. Most of what you may have experienced is just regular day-to-day -day winter up here. Except, unlike you guys down there, we don't, uh, we don't flail our arms around and panic and shut all the businesses and schools down for the next seven weeks. Except for some of you. Some of you experience this stuff a little bit more frequently. Some of you actually get some credit. Like those of you in uh, Minnesota and the Dakotas, and also obviously the, the three central Canadian provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. So I know at least some of you feel where I'm coming from. But my whole get on my level speech aside, this was quite a while and quite a decent blast of cold. And almost certainly most of you, at least those of you that actually pay the bills in your house, you're going to get a very, very interestingly large heating bill at the end of this month, or rather the start of this month now, because this video is probably going up on February 1st. Now, what your individual bill turns out to be will depend on what kind of heating you have and how warm you actually decided to keep your house or apartment during the whole week. The better majority of you, I would assume, heat with natural gas, as that tends to be the default in the U.S., with most states running usually between 50 to 75 percent of their buildings heating with natural gas, and the remaining percentage being split between electricity, propane, and heating oil, although heating oil is pretty much dying out as a fuel source. Now, unfortunately, regarding the natural gas, despite the fact that the market's been being relatively stupid lately and has been constantly dropping the price of natural gas when it really shouldn't have been. Unfortunately, the market price actually isn't really tied to what you pay in particular. That's the trading price of it and is the price it goes for in large bulk trade movements. What affects your bill in particular much more directly is actually something called the spot price. The spot price is more of a, what most resources prices should be. It's more immediately and directly tied to supply and demand. So when demand for natural gas, almost always from heating during the winter, really cranks up, then the spot price will begin to skyrocket. With obviously the more constrained the supply gets, the higher it goes and the faster it climbs. Last winter, during last winter's polar vortex event, the spot price shot up over $7 per thousand cubic feet, whereas normally for the last few years or so, it tends most of the year to hang around three. I won't be surprised. In fact, I actually expect that this particular polar vortex event will have sent the spot price shooting up into double digits. Probably not that far into double digits, but probably just over 10. Now, we won't actually know that until next Thursday because the data that releases each week is oil and gas data regarding the previous week. So the oil and gas numbers that I'm about to read off in this video, like I normally do each week, are technically data regarding last week. The data for this week will be released next week. So welcome everybody to another weekly energy and resource video. For anybody who cares about and wants to hear about energy resources, oil, gas, mining, all the things that, you know, underpin and hold up our civilization and actually really govern the aspects of your lives, potentially without you ever realizing it. And at this point, definitely without the mainstream media ever really talking about it. If you're actually interested in that stuff and want to hear about it, then please subscribe and stick around because that is the main focus here. Now running down the data I mentioned, we'll get to natural gas in a second. But quickly running through oil first, U.S. oil production held flat again at 11.9 million barrels per day. Again, as always, I suspect its second and final peak is going to be between 13.4 and 13.7. If anything new comes up, I might adjust it, 
but I'm sticking with that at the moment. This year in particular, I expect it to get up to probably 12.8, as most of the U.S. production increase has been from the Permian Basin, and the Permian is starting to slow down and is going to continue to do so. U.S. soil consumption fell. Last week, the average was 20.8 million barrels per day, whereas the week before, it was averaging over 21. And with the shutdown over and almost everybody back to work, and the national parks open again, U.S. gasoline consumption jumped right back up into its normal average area, coming in this time at 9.56 million barrels per day. Diesel fuel consumption dropped from last time down to 4.12 million barrels per day. Jet fuel climbed up to 1.63 million barrels per day. And propane consumption for last week dropped a little bit down to 1.61 million barrels per day equivalent. Now, since propane is one of the other heating sources people use, the data release next week, which will be for this week, is definitely going to spike up there. I expect it to blow right past 2 million barrels a day equivalent, probably up to 2.1 maybe. Price-wise, oil has still remained relatively the same, fluctuating between $52 and $55 per barrel. And over on the natural gas side, U.S. natural gas production climbed a little bit from the previous round, up to 98.5 billion cubic feet per day. U.S. natural gas consumption last week averaged 122 billion cubic feet per day. Individual numbers within that being heating demand, climbing up to 54.7 billion cubic feet per day. And when the data for this week comes out next Thursday, I will not be surprised to see that heating demand number up over 100 billion cubic feet per day all on its own. I honestly wouldn't even be surprised to see it go up towards 120. Demand from natural gas-fired power plants climbed up to 26.4 billion cubic feet per day, as a lot of heating in the more southern states tends to be electric, and we've been shutting down all of our coal plants one by one and replacing them with natural gas-fired power plants, a decision that's going to backfire on us in the not-too-distant future. But so, as the cold reached the southern states and heating demand in the southern states cranked up, obviously that shot up electricity demand, and so natural gas-fired power plants cranked their output up a little bit to compensate. And natural gas consumption for fuel for the natural gas pipeline's pumping system itself rose to 7.2 billion cubic feet per day. U.S. natural gas storage inventories took another big drop, dropping down to just under 2.2 trillion cubic feet in storage. Whereas normally, around this time of year, on average, we would still have about 2.53 the drop last week was by over 170 billion cubic feet. And the drop from this week, when we get to see the data next week, is definitely going to be over a 200 billion cubic foot withdrawal. Actually, it's definitely going to be over a 250 billion cubic foot withdrawal from the inventories. I, I'd, I'd put three out of four. Three out of four confidence, it honestly might be over 300. Now also on the natural gas supply demand graph, you can see the individual spikes that go up. And the spike we're going to see next week from the height of this polar vortex is probably going to break the record of the last one, which spiked up to 158 billion cubic feet. I absolutely think it's going over that, over 160, 162, maybe even up to 178, but we'll see when it actually comes out. Also, the spot price, obviously, we'll see when it actually comes out. The market price, which again, doesn't really dictate your gas bill, but the market price remained between $2.75 and $3.20 per thousand cubic feet over the course of the week. Now, outside of the U.S., we have Venezuela, whose oil production had been falling for the last two and a half years, and as I said last time, had finally seemed to stabilize themselves at around 1.15 million barrels per day. Well, that's probably not going to last any longer than just these couple weeks. Because now, after this election and the standing president's refusal to accept it, Venezuela, which was already collapsing and in somewhat chaos, has erupted into even worse collapse and chaos than it was already in. So that hope of stability, that came up for a moment, has now just essentially been thrown out the window. So absolutely, Venezuela's oil production is going to resume plummeting, which 
has nothing to do with it having peaked, with depletion of any of the fields. It has everything to do with corruption and with their state industries, just bankruptcy. No money left, no money to upkeep the fields, replace parts, replace wells, drill additional wells, set up equipment for field flooding and repressurization, nothing. So as stuff breaks, as stuff shuts down, they just have to leave it and they just lose the production from that particular unit one by one by one and then dozen by dozen by dozen. So normally they would be holding a plateau of around 3 million barrels per day, but now they've gone all the way down to 1.15 and are probably about to resume going down and are probably going to go under one. And Australia had one of its worst heat waves yet, one that sent electricity demand for air conditioning soaring so high that it started causing grid failures in some regions to the point that parts of Australia had to resort to communistic measures where they'd have rotating allowances. This section of the city would get its electricity cut off for two hours to, you know, to save power from demand. Then they'd get it switched back on. Then this section would get it shut off for two hours. Then the next section, you know, real fun stuff for a first world nation. Now, unfortunately, Australia, in terms of its power generation, is not going down the brightest path it could possibly be choosing. Australia, similar to the U.S., is going down the coal is evil, shut down all the coal plants route. However, unlike the U.S., Australia is also going down the get rid of the natural gas power plants too route and is throwing themselves onto the solar power craze train. Now, before you assume that I'm anti-renewables, I'm not. I'm almost exclusively just anti-solar because solar isn't even stupid. It's suicide. Solar power is probably the least workable and the dumbest of the renewable options you could possibly choose. Yet it's the one that apparently the entire world has fallen in love with. Solar panels don't generate a lot of power. It takes a lot of them to generate a lot of power. It takes countless square miles of them, or countless square kilometers, to generate something near the power output of a regular power plant. See, with a few exceptions, most solar fields, solar power generation facilities, you'll see listed when you scroll across the map, there'll be something like, you know, generates 20 megawatts, Oh, this one's big, it generates 80 megawatts. Regular power plants, coal-fired power plants, natural gas, nuclear especially, tend to generate between 1 and 4 gigawatts. You know, the kind of power amounts that modern civilization actually consumes its electricity in. Now, Australia is free to choose. By all means, they can plaster their entire desert with solar panels if they want to. Except, actually, they can't because it's not really going to work. Because of the one underlying problem that no one who's in love with solar seems to actually think about, or even know. Solar panels need silver to function. They need a lot of it. And silver, for anyone who's not aware, is not a common substance. It's a rare metal. And global silver production, the amount of silver being mined out of the ground every year, actually already peaked back in 2015. And at the same time, we've climbed up to the point of almost 11% of all silver consumed on Earth each year being used to make solar panels, which are still doing relatively nothing in comparison. For the moment, this supply problem has not become an actual problem because silver consumption for solar panels has slowly just been inflating into the gap that's been left by the death of traditional photography you know, actual cameras with actual film. Because camera film used silver. And camera film used to be nearly 10% of world silver consumption every year. However, as traditional photography has died, that's left a gap that solar panel silver consumption has slowly inflated into. However, there's basically no more room. Once traditional photography is like completely dead in the next couple of years, that's it. There's, there's no more gap being created for solar panel demand to expand into, and it's just going to start competing with the other demands. 
which on its own would send the price of silver and anything that has silver used in it skyrocketing. However, that's already about to happen because global silver production from mines peaked in 2015 and is still dropping. So both of those combining together are going to send silver shooting through the roof relatively soon. I'm not going to make any particular calls because I was assuming the market was a little bit more intelligent and would have actually reacted to the situation sooner. And the market's kind of just been sitting there on it, not really seeming to care. And so speaking of it as if it's a sentient being, uh, the market looks like it's just going to wait more for the aluminum baseball bat to the face moment. I would say a silver baseball bat to the face, but no one would actually pay for that. So yeah, solar, solar power, not solar thermal, mind you. Solar thermal is actually useful, but solar panels also known as solar PV, solar photovoltaic, that kind of solar, that's a suicide route. And unfortunately, seems to be the route that everyone wants to jump on, instead of the better routes, like solar thermal and wind to an extent, where it works at least. Not where wind is common, but where wind is constant. Like in that little strip of land that connects Germany to Denmark, between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, where there's basically eternal wind blowing once you go up about 30 meters off the ground. That's an example of where wind works. So that's the key to go with. Not where wind is common, but where wind works. As in where the wind is essentially eternal. And there are quite a number of places on Earth where that's actually the case. And or my personal favorite, and probably the better of any of the renewable sources, geothermal. But no one seems to care about geothermal, despite it having some of the best potential. Everyone just wants to hop on the solar train. So, uh, sorry, my Australian friends. Choo-choo, I guess. So, back to my happy voice. That's it for this week. Hope everybody enjoyed. Leave a like on the video if you did. Don't forget to subscribe and stick around for additional content. We do one of these every week, along with other videos every once in a while. If you want to support my survival and existence, links to my Patreon, PayPal, and Redbubble shop are in the description down below, as well as a link to my aviation and travel channel as well. Hope everybody's doing great, and I will see you all around next time.